now we move to the talk by uh, David, um, David Wedge, uh, who's a veteran of uh, Bertinoro meetings, uh, <laughs> uh, very famous in this community for his Battenberg algorithm and for a uh, great my microphone as well. Um, uh, so I was uh, kind of thinking yesterday, what, 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 should I, what should I actually talk about? Um, I've decided to, um, to pick up on, on a couple of the, the, the talks uh, yesterday. Um, so I'm going to be kind of jumping around talking about um, a number of different papers, but um, two of the papers that I'm going to talk about today um, are um, uh, the, the Life History of 21 Breast Cancers, which, are, which was a paper that I think was referred to by, by Quaid yesterday. Uh, it was published uh, in, in Cell in 2012. Uh, I'm also going to be talking about um, a paper, the, uh, the Evolutionary History of Lethal Metastatic Prostate Cancer, uh, which I think was mentioned by, uh, by Ben yesterday. Um, so that, those cover the, 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 the two areas that uh, Ava has just mentioned, uh, the, the Battenberg algorithm, which is an algorithm that I developed for, for copy number calling, uh, and the second paper uh, is on metastatic uh, prostate cancers. Uh, I'm also going to be throwing in a, a few other papers as well um, uh, to kind of give... give uh, particularly to, to, to give the students a kind of feel for, for the kind of analysis that we do. Uh, so uh, many of you will have, will have seen this, this figure before. Um, uh, it, it basically is, is uh, uh, saying, this, saying what uh, a lot of previous speakers have said. Um, so we know that, uh, that cancer um, evolves over time. Um, uh, partly in response to uh, treatment, um, also uh, very, very important um, is uh, acquisition of, of metastatic potential, uh, which is another evolutionary process. Um, uh, if you look at this, this uh, figure, what you see is the, the development from, from the left, left to the right, so starting from normal healthy cells, um, uh, cancers or, ca or cells uh, will acquire mutations uh, all the time, some of which will be uh, driving mutations, which uh, Jeffrey's just been talking about. Uh, so the driving mutations are the, are the red stars shown on this figure. Um, the, uh, where you see the label, the, uh, the MRCA is the most recent common ancestor um, of all uh, cells within the tumor. Um, so that... Uh, that's the, 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 the star in the middle here. Uh, so all uh, cells within the tumor will have mutations that were in that founding cell. Uh, and those mutations uh, we, we, we call clonal. Uh, so you know, the, the, the cancers expand as a, um, a, as a clone. They're all descended from one uh, founding uh, ancestor um, by, by, uh, through, through clonal process. You know, there's no, uh, the, the, there's no uh, sexual reproduction. It's entirely clonal. Uh, but as the tumor's tumor expands, um, individual cells will be acquiring, uh, each, each of the cells will be acquiring further mutations. Um, and um, as you can see here, uh, some, of, some of those cells uh, w won't actually expand to fill the whole of the tumor, um, so they'll appear subclonally. So you can see if the, sa if the sample is taken at this time point here with this vertical line, uh, we'll sample from different cells that have different genotypes. They may have this dark blue genotype, uh, this purple genotype, this more reddish uh, genotype. And so cells that, that are in, uh, within those subsets, um, uh, there'll only be a, a fraction of cells that have those mutations, and so we call those subclones. Um, so so th these, these are the topics that I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be saying quite a lot about um, copy number um, and particularly subclonal copy number. So identifying those copy number changes that are only present in a fraction of the cells. Um, um, then I'm going to be talking about uh, single nucleotide variants and identifying, again, those um, variants that are seen uh, subclonally just in a fraction of cells. Um, then uh, uh, um, uh, Towards the end of my talk, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, tree building using uh, multi-sampling approaches. Uh, and uh, following on from uh, Ben's talk, uh, I'd like to talk about metastatic migration patterns. So um, this, is, um, uh, th this is taken from uh, the, the Life History of 21 Breast Cancers, which was a paper published in 2012, where we'd sequenced uh, one uh, breast cancer uh, to very high depth. So we, we'd sequenced, we had whole genome sequencing, to 188x, which is very very high depth. Um, but I, I, I should say at the outset that um, we actually uh, 
subsequently downsampled that um, the, the, the the data from that sample and found that we were actually able to reproduce all the analysis using um, 40x. So actually, you don't need to have really high depth to do that. Um, this is just to kind of uh, orient you on this. Um, so this is um, um, a figure that used to identify uh, copy number changes. Um, so. Uh, show, shown on each of these plots, the, the, the very small red dots, each of them is a, uh, a, a snip, a, uh, a germline snip that is heterozygous um, in, in uh, normal cells. Uh, so what we expect is that because um, they're heterozygous, um, they will have 50% allele frequency, they have 50% of one allele, 50% of the other uh, allele. So what you see in the middle track um, is, the, is, is what we call the, the B allele frequency. And in regions that are normal copy number, uh, that's at 50%, at 0.5. So you can see for most of the genome, uh, it's at 0.5. Where we've got copy number changes, they could be either copy number gains, uh, which would lead to, to more of one allele than the other, or they could be copy number losses, um, which will lead to, to less of that allele. Um, where we have copy number losses, the B allele frequency doesn't actually go down to zero. Uh, the reason for that is that we have, within our sample, we have uh, normal contamination. So you can see at the bottom, um, the, the, this, this particular sample, uh, we estimated to have about 70% tumor cells and about 30% normal cells. Um, uh, the, the track at the top shows uh, log R, which is an estimate of the, the kind of coverage. So we expect that to go up where you've got a copy number gain and to go down where you've got a copy number loss. Uh, and the figure at the bottom is our estimate of, of the actual copy number. Uh, so the purple lines are total copy number, the blue lines are uh, minor copy number. So in regions that are normal diploid copy number, we expect a purple line at two for the total copy number and the minor copy number at one. Uh, and again, you see that that is what most of the genome looks like. Uh, we have purple line at two and a blue line at one. But you can see that um, we have certain uh, regions that, that have uh, losses. So in particular, you can see one, one P has a loss. Uh, one Q is gained. Uh, we have a loss on chromosome four. We have a loss on chromosome uh, uh, 17, I think. Um, what we were very interested in, yeah. So, so I can't. The minor copy number, yeah. So, so basically, so we had the we had the two alleles, um, um, the one allele and the other allele. So, so we can on, on these figures, you, you can plot just the the, uh, the the paternal and the maternal allele. Um, the reason we don't do that is because basically, in, in normal diploid regions, they just be on top of each other. You just have one, one of each. So instead, what, what what we do is we plot the the total copy number and the minor copy number. So, so if it's a region that's got less loss of heterozygosity, then minor copy number will be at zero. Um, uh, um, but if, you, if you've got a, if you've got a so say you've got a, a gained region that's two plus one, the total copy number will be three, but the minor copy number will be one because we still, we still have both copies. So the regions that have got loss of heterozygosity will all have, um, will all have a blue line at zero. Um, what, what we were very, very interested in with, with this figure is actually the, the lines that are not on integer values, not close to integer values. So you'll notice on chromosome 13, these interesting lines, purple and blue lines, that are, that are not at, at zero or at one. Um, and these are um, indicative of a subclonal copy number loss. So, so whereas if it was diploid, these would be at two and, two and one. If it was a, um, a loss of a copy, They'd be at one and zero, like on one uh, P, but in fact they're not. They're they're, they're in between. Um, and what this indicates is that there's been a subclonal uh, copy number loss on chromosome 13. So some of the cells on chromosome th have, have lost chromosome 13, and some of them haven't. And you can estimate from, from the position uh, of those lines that the uh, chromosome 13 is actually being lost in about 70% of the cells, uh, the tumor cells in this tumor. Um, we then looked at chromosome seven. Chromosome seven is very interesting because it, it, it looks like there's been a, a slight drop in the, in the uh, copy number. And if we look at the, uh, the log R plot at the top, it looks like there may be, may be a bit of a drop, but we don't see a split in the B allele frequency. Um, it does look like there's been a kind of a slight broadening. I don't know if you can see, uh, but the, the, in the B, the B allele frequency, it looks like there's a slight broadening of this band on chromosome seven, uh, but it doesn't clearly split into two bands um, as, as, as we saw in, 
um, uh, the figures that, that Roland shows yesterday. Um, if you have a if you have a, a, a clear copy number in a in a large proportion of cells, then this B allele frequency band will actually split in two. So we we wanted to find a method that, that would actually that would enable us to, to to split that band that B allele frequency band and identify subclonal copy number changes. Um, so um, this is. Uh, on the left is kind of showing, showing a, it's a kind of a, a cartoon uh, of, of what we've got. So if we have a, a mixed population, where we've actually got most of the cells that are uh, normal diploid, and we may have just lost a, a chromosome just in 20% of the cells. So out of every uh, 10 cells, we'll just have two of them that look like this. Um, so, so in this case, they've lost the, uh, this allele, which has a, a GC at these heterozygous SNPs, and they've just retained this copy that have an AA. So if we have um, uh, 18 reads, then we would expect that on average we'll have 10 of them that come from one, uh, one, one allele and eight that come from another allele. Um, but we, we basically, we, we have random sampling of, of the DNA, and the DNA has been uh, fragmented into, into uh, um, you know, sm small strands uh, that have been sequenced, um, and so there's, there's a lot of noise. It's basically, we have basically binomial uh, uh, draw fr from that distribution of 10 eighteenths. So at any individual um, locus, um, we, we won't see exactly that, that 10 to 8 ratio. Um, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be variation around that, that um, value. Um, but what, what we can do is um, phase the, the heterozygous SNPs. So what we did is we took each of our um, tumors and we phased it by comparing against um, a, a large panel of genomes. We used the, the 1,000 genomes panel. Um, and basically, um, so we, we start with uh, SNPs like this. So we'll have a, maybe a, an AT at the first uh, heterozygous SNP, then a GT, then a CT, then an AC, but we don't know which of them are actually on the maternal and which are on the paternal um, allele. So we use um, statistical phasing to, to, to find uh, probabilistically whether which alleles are, are most likely to go together uh, based on a, on, a, on a large population uh, of individuals. So we can then say, we we'll think actually this is one, one allele has these, uh, these alleles, the A, T, T, A, the other has this T, G, C, C. We can then string together all those alleles, and we can average the uh, allele frequency across all of those alleles. Um, that gives us much, much higher resolution to separate the, uh, the B allele frequency bands. Um, and we can actually get down to um, kind of split of like 48%, 52%, uh, which, which would represent um, a, a copy number gain or a loss in only about 2% of cells. So we can get down to very fine resolution. So when we applied it to, 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 this, to our tumor, um, we saw that um, chromosome 13, which I, which I showed you earlier, clearly split uh, into two bands. Um, where, you, where you see the, the, the red and the blue here um, is the, the phasing that we get from uh, statistical phasing. Um, now, the, the, the phasing isn't 100% um, reliable um, because you have, so you have linkage disequilibrium across most of the most of the genome, uh, but you have uh, recombination hotspots where, where within, within the population um, you, you very frequently get um, uh, recombination. And in those, in those positions, it's uncertain uh, which, uh, which, which alleles are actually linked together. So, so the algorithms will, will occasionally make mistakes. So you'll have um, a, a load of SNPs that have been correctly phased, give you a nice red band here, uh, but then there'll be an error and they'll switch down to the other side. Uh, but in cancer, because we've got copy number changes, we can see where there's been these switches because the, 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 there's a step in the, in, the B, in the B allele frequency, so we can actually correct that, and then we get completely correct phasing. Uh, that's chromosome seven. I say what the, the, the chromosome we were interested in was really chromosome seven, uh, where uh, I showed you earlier we weren't able to separate the, 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 the band into two bands, but using uh, uh, this algorithm, we were able to separate. You can see this alternation of red and blue bands. Um, and this pattern is, is the reason that this algorithm is called uh, Battenberg algorithm. So pe people from the UK will know this, uh, this cake shown on the, the upper left-hand side, uh, quite very, very popular um, in the UK, uh, has this kind of uh, uh, chessboard uh, pattern 
And when, when we first saw this pattern, we just thought it was reminiscent of, the, of Battenberg cakes. That's why it's called the Battenberg algorithm. Um, just as a, as a uh, kind of negative control, chromosome 3 has no uh, copy number changes, either clonal or subclonal, and the B allele frequency is exactly on 0.5. The red and the blue dots lie on top of each other. But then on chromosome 6, we saw something unexpected uh, that you can see there's actually a separation of the blue and the red bands uh, with, the, with the blue peeping out the top of the, the red. Uh, and that, was, that showed us there was actually a deletion in just 14% of tumor cells. Um, so we can actually get down with this algorithm, we can get right down to about uh, 3% um, copy number changes. Um, so when, we, when we've done that, we can identify very small uh, copy number changes. But what we then want to do is to say, well, are, are these changes clonal or subclonal? And if they're subclonal, what proportion of cells do we think they are in? Um, so the, w one way to think about this is that we have, we have two alleles. So we have the, the major copy number, which is shown on the x-axis, the minor copy number shown on the um, x-axis. Um, and each copy number segment will lie somewhere in this space. So we're showing a, a, a dot here, the green dot here. Which, so this represents one copy number segment. Uh, and we, we can estimate the major copy number and the minor copy number. Now, another way of thinking about this is using um, polar coordinates. So if you think about this in terms of polar coordinates, um, the B allele frequency uh, corresponds to the, the angle, uh, your, your kind of uh, uh, theta going around here. So if you've got a, a, a diploid genome, then this would just be at 45 degrees with uh, x equals y. But if you've actually got more of one allele than the other, then it will move around uh, so you'll have, you, you'll have an, uh, an imbalance and that, that angle will change. Um, the other value that you need is the distance from the origin, so the distance along these lines, uh, which is kind of the, the, the log R or the coverage. So if we've got higher coverage at a particular region, that would indicate a gain. And if you've got lower coverage, it'll be more further down to the, to the bottom left. Uh, you have lower log R. Um, now, when, when we um, measure these, these values in genomes, the B allele frequency is, is very um, unbiased and very accurate uh, measure, um, particularly if, because we, we're using phasing, and so we have thousands of SNPs within one copy number segment. So the B, the B allele frequency is very accurate. The log R, on the other hand, um, is, is, is highly variable. So, so log R will vary um, depending on uh, replication timing, GC content, possibly other, other things as well. So often you see that the log R is quite variable. So basically what we, what we do is, is we assume that the BLL frequency is very accurate, um, but the, the log R can be, can be quite variable. So, so when we have a, a point here, um, uh, actually it, 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 the, the real uh, value actually lies kind of somewhere along a line uh, going along here because the, the log R is actually quite uncertain. Uh, so in this case, what we would do is we would say, well, this, this green dot here uh, within the some uncertainty, and actually it should be moved up to this, um, this point here, and is uh, therefore corresponds to a mixture of two different copy number states. This one here, which is labeled X, Y plus one, and this copy number state here, which is labeled X plus one, Y plus one. And basically the distance between this point and this point tells us what the proportion of this copy number state and this copy number state is. And we can estimate it or, or we can calculate it using this equation here. Great. Um, so, so, I mean, so, this, so this identifies two, so, so this is just applied to each segment. So this is one, one segment and we assume that there are two, different, two copy number states um, within, within any one segment. So, so we, have to, we have to make that assumption because we've only got two, uh, two variables. Um, so we can't fit a mixture of three. So basically, we, we, just, we just move this uh, green point to the, to the nearest um, edge, and then we, we just assume that it's a mixture of these two different copy number states. So and what, you know, one of them could be normal diploid, uh, in which case we just have you know, one, one subclone with a copy number change, or they could actually both be aberrant. We could have a mixture of two plus one and three plus one. Yeah, we, we don't make any kind of assumptions about, about that. Yeah. Well, they're both, sub, they're both subclonal, so, so we would have some, some cells that are in two, yeah, yeah, we, we, we kind of, so, so yeah, we, we're assuming that it's a mix of two plus one and three plus one. 
So, so I suppose the, the assumption in that case would be that we've had um, uh, that we've had a gain, uh, clonal gain, followed by a subclonal gain. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we can uh, time or, or order um, copy number events using uh, using a couple of little um, uh, methods. Um, the first one, I think, I think this was mentioned um, in one of the talks yesterday, um, is to look at the mutate in, in regions that have had a, a gain of copy number. Is to look at the mutations. So mutations that have occurred before the gain uh, will be on two copies. So on this figure, they're shown in uh, purple, uh, whereas the mutations that have occurred after. Uh, a copy number gain will be done just uh, one copy. Those are shown in yellow. Uh, we can basically just count those mutations, and that gives an, e an estimate of when the copy number gain has occurred. Um, the, the second method is to actually use the, the output from Battenberg. Um, so, so from Battenberg, we can say which um, copy number events are clonal, which are subclonal. Um, uh, here, I think, I think Quaid's, Quaid's question is, is relevant here, that we do need to work out what the ancestral state is. So we would, we would assume that a genome has started as diploid, um, we then need to identify whether there's been a whole genome duplication or not, uh, and then we can say what the, the subsequent events uh, were. Um, we can then say what is the, uh, the, the, the cancer cell fraction, what's the, what the fraction of cells that have a copy number event, uh, we can do that across uh, each, each tumor. We can therefore um, order the copy number events from the clonal to the, to the subclonal. Um, and then we, we looking across uh, multiple samples, we can uh, identify the kind of general trends. Um, we can identify those copy number events that tend to occur early and those that tend to occur late. Um, this just just some results from a, a paper published um, just a couple of months ago uh, in prostate cancer. Um, we separated the uh, prostate cancers into those with um, ETS fusion, which is which is common, is in about 50% of prostate uh, cancers, and those that were ETS negative that didn't have the, the fusion. Um, and when we timed the events, we saw there was a, a very different pattern in the ETS positive and the ETS negative tumours. Um, so in the uh, the ETS positive tumours shown at the at the top. Um, uh, very commonly have this, have this loss on chromosome 21, which leads to um, tempus 2 erg fusion, which is a, an ETS fusion, and they also uh, often have an early gain of um, chromosome 8, 8Q. Um, whereas if we look at the, the ECS negative tumors, um, they, they, there's, there's not such a simple pattern that we're seeing an, a number of different um, copy number changes, and particularly early, so towards the left, are losses on chromosome 5, chromosome 6 and chromosome 13. Uh, when we look at the individual tumors, we find that actually these are often co-occurring in the same tumors. Um, so, so on the right, uh, you can see uh, in, in blue those events that are co-occurring, and in, in orange, orange brown those that are mutually exclusive. Uh, so we can see that um, the uh, ETS fusion, I don't know if you can read that in, in, in green, is mutually exclusive with um, uh, various events um, that, that we see only in ECS negative tumors, but then they often co-occur, so we can see uh, that we have these losses, uh, so this is homozygous deletion actually on chromosome five, often co-occurs with losses on chromosome two, losses on chromosome uh, six, uh, and gains on chromosome seven. So it appears that in ECS negative tumors, um, they, they have to acquire a number of different um, uh, copy number changes, and they very commonly occur early. They're nearly always clonal rather than subclonal. Okay, um, I'm going to, um, that, that's taken a, a bit longer than I, than I, than I hope to talk about copy number. Um, I, I now want to talk about um, uh, SNVs uh, and how we, we identify subclonal clusters from the SNVs. Um, so this is a figure for, shown from the, for, from the paper that I showed earlier, the, the life history of 21 breast cancers. Um, you can see th this is basically showing the, uh, the, the allele frequency of the mutations on the, on the y-axis against just the, just the depth. And as I say, this was a very highly sequenced tumor to, to 188x. Um, um, but what we see is, it, is, is this big cluster at around uh, point, point 0.35. Um, and these are the clonal mutations. So I said earlier that this was, a, this was about 70% pure tumor. So if we have mutations that are just on one copy um, out of two, they'll have a allele frequency of 35%. Um, so these are the clonal mutations um, uh, in, in the tumor, but we could see that there were these additional clusters further down. Um, the, the reason that, that, that these, um, uh, 
uh, some of these dots are in orange, these are shown on, on chromosome 10, and the reason I'm showing those is that chromosome 10 was pure uh, diploid. There were, no, there were no copy number changes on chromosome 10. Um, so, so this variation, the allele frequency, wasn't the result of copy number changes, um, and uh, we, we think must, must be because there's um, subclonality uh, leading to lower allele frequency. Um, so we have here four clusters, the clonal cluster, and then three um, subclonal clusters at different allele frequencies. Um, to identify these, we, we clustered them using a, a Bayesian uh, Dirichlet process, which, which, will, um, which makes no assumptions about the, the, the number of clusters, um, but can uh, use the, the, the distribution of the, of the data. So, so we model this as a, as a binomial distribution, and we uh, were able to, to pull out these uh, four, four clusters. Um, I think that, 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 that's, that's all I'm going to say about, about that paper. Um, but um, we, we basically using the, 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 the copy number and the, and the point mutations, we were actually able to, to reconstruct the, the, the phylogenetic tree. Um, in uh, subsequent studies, we, we've moved towards using uh, more frequently uh, multiple samples. So that's, that study, we only had a, a single sample from, from uh, each cancer. Um, but in, in you know, most studies of, of evolution, it's, it's very advantageous to have uh, multiple samples. Uh, and then what you're doing is clustering in, in multiple dimensions. If you have 10 samples from, from a tumor, um, you're actually clustering these mutations in, in 10 dimensions. Um, so you'll have the, you know, for, for each single mutation, you'll have the allele frequency in each of your 10 samples. Um, and then we're trying to group the mutations in this kind of 10 dimensional space um, to, to, to identify subclones. Um, I just want to kind of give a, um, a, a warning here. Um, so in, in that, the study that I showed um, just now on, on, that, on that single sample, um, we just clustered allele frequency, and we actually didn't, didn't really um, uh, take account of copy number. Uh, we were able to do that because there were, there were very few copy number changes in that tumor, um, and because those copy number changes that there were had, um, had all occurred very early. So the mutations um, all occurred after the copy number changes. They were all on a single chromosome copy. Um, but in general, that, that isn't true. So, so we, uh, in, in most tumors, we will have some mutations that have occurred early, followed by a copy number change, and so they'll actually be on two or three copies. And so we have to allow for that. Um, this is just showing you what, what, what you get if you just cluster the uh, allele frequencies without taking account of copy number. Um, this is from a uh, prostate cancer uh, sample. These, we actually have uh, two, uh, me two metastases here uh, from, this, from the same tumor. Um, if we cluster the allele frequencies, you can see they, they, they roughly cluster on the, on the leading diagonal. So it looks like we have similar allele frequencies in the, on the, in the two tumors. But if we adjust these for um, copy number, it looks very different. Uh, so basically the message is, uh, don't do this. Um, don't cluster on, on raw allele frequencies. You really need to take account of uh, copy number. And just to show you what it looks like after you adjust for copy number, it's completely different. So, so all the clusters have moved off the, the leading diagonal um, because we've now removed the effect of copy number and we're just purely looking at the subclonality. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so, so the question was, how, how do you adjust for clonal and subclonal copy number changes? So maybe I'll, if I go to the next slide. Um, so, so these are, these are the um, equations that we use to adjust the allele frequency to what we call the, the, the cancer cell fraction, uh, which is the, the fraction of, ca of, of cancer cells carrying a mutation. Um, the, um, I, 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 I'm not going to go through these, these equations because I don't really have time, uh, but the, um, the, the kind of critical things are that we have the, the allele frequency here, R over R, so R is the number of mutant reads, and R is, uh, big R is, the, is the, the total coverage. So this is just the allele frequency, and you can see that it's affected by the purity of the sample, which is rho, uh, and the copy number in the tumor, and the copy number in the normal sample. Um, but it's also affected by this value C, which is the multiplicity, it's the number of uh, chromosomes carrying a mutation. So if we've had gains, then that can be, that's the value of C can be two or three or four um, if, if we've had multiple gains. Um, if we've had copy number losses, then you can still see mutations if it's been a subclonal 
copy number loss. Uh, so C can also be a non-integer value. So, um, so if we had had a region which had lost, which had a copy number loss of 40% of cells, then we would only actually see the mutation in the remaining 60%. Uh, so in that situation, we could actually call, call this value as being uh, 0.6 because it would have, it would have, the, the mutations would only appear on, in 60% of cells. Um, by doing that, we're basically being um, conservative because we are assuming that the mutations have actually occurred clonally and have then been lost because of the subclonal copy number loss. Um, so essentially, it's, 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 it's a conservative approach to, um, to, try and, to, try, to try and fit as many of the mutations as clonal um, as, as possible. Um, so you, yeah, you could uh, question that assumption, but we, I mean, the reason we do that is that we want to, when we do identify subclones, we want to be really sure that, that they are subclonal. Um, Yeah. Well, I'd, I, 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 I don't think you do. So, so what we do is, is we, ass we, we estimate that, so, so, so we, we get a list of the, the possible multiplicities. So in that, in that case, if, we have, if you have a mixture of, of uh, copy number states that are 2 plus 1 and 3 plus 1, um, then your mutations can, um, they can either be on uh, two copies or they can be on 2.4 copies or whatever the, the, yeah, the mix is. If you've got 60% of um, copy number two and 40% of copy number three, then they could be, they could be a mixture of that, so they would be 2.4 if they've occurred uh, um, before the, the, the second copy number gain. So basically, we, we consider all possibilities. No, no, we haven't. No, we haven't. So, so, so it could be that, that, that the, the ancestral state is, copy, is, is three, and then we've subclonally lost um, uh, the, the, that, that chromosome in some cells, but the mutation would then would still appear in, on average, 2.4 copies. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it started at two and then, then increased to 2.4. If it started at three and gone down to 2.4, it'll still be on an average of 2.4 copies. So, so I mean, in that in that case, it, it, it must have done because it's more because it it must have occurred before the clonal changes. Um, if if it's occurred after the, the clonal changes, it can only be on um, it, it, it would have to be on, on one copy or, or less. If it's occurred after the after the gains. So I, 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 I don't think that's right, because we, we basically we, we consider all, all possible um, values of the multiplicity that you can get that would, that would result from the copy number changes. Um. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, so, sorry? I understood correctly. You you said you assumed that the the dollar mutations occurred before the copy number change. So 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 in that situation, um, uh, it, it must have done. If if the um, so if the estimated multiplicity um, is more than is more than one, then the mutation must have occurred before um, before the first gain. If 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 if, if it's less than one. Then we wouldn't. Um, uh, well, well, if, if it's um, if, if it's less than the than the smallest subclone, then we, we know that it's occurred after the after the last subclonal change. So then we wouldn't make any adjustment. We'll only make changes if it if it can possibly have occurred um, before before um, one of the copy number changes. So we basically we, we consider all the kind of possible um, possible permutations. <laughs> Um, we, we use various uh, quality control measures to, to um, assess, assess our clusters. Um, 
so um, firstly, we, we exclude any clusters that contain less than 1% one, than 1 of the mutations, which is kind of of, of the order of, of 100 mutations uh, with whole genome sequencing. Um, we also look at the, uh, the distribution of the, uh, the cancer cell fraction of the mutations. So sometimes we get clusters that are being combined um, that should be separated out. Um, and uh, we're also very, very suspicious if we have mutations which all appear to have occurred just on one or two chromosomes. Um, so, so we would expect that mutations are, are kind of fa fairly randomly occurring across all chromosomes. Um, if we have a cluster where all the mutations um, appear to be in one, uh, in one, um, on one chromosome, that is, is most likely indicative of, of an error with copy number calling. Um, so if we have uh, missed a copy number event, um, we won't then be making correct adjustments uh, for, the, uh, for, for the copy number change, and so all the mutations within that region will end up being put in their own cluster. Um, so this, this is what we, what we get. So, so we do the clustering in multiple dimensions, but obviously to, to, to view them, we have to just see them in, in two dimensions. Um, and so uh, you can see the, these various different clusters. Um, first of all, shared clonal. So this is a cluster which is at one in this sample, this C sample, and also one in this E sample. Um, so those are, are clonal in both samples. If they're clonal in all samples, then we would say they were, they were truncal, they were in the most the most recent common ancestor of the tumor. Um, but we also see mutations which may be clonal just in one sample. So if this was a, was a primary tumor, it would mean that they've expanded in one region, um, except there's one sort of subclan that's expanding in one region, and another that's expanding in a different region. Um, uh, here, these are actually, I think one of these is a primary sample, and one of them is a metastatic sample. Uh, so here it indicates that um, we've got, a, we've got um, ongoing evolution in the primary and, and separately in the metastasis. Um, we also have these mutations which are seen uh, uniquely subclonal uh, within each sample, which again here is, is indicative of ongoing evolution within the individual sites. And then um, the, 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 those uh, clusters that we're, we're maybe most interested in are those that are shared subclonal. So they're subclonal in both samples. So if, this was, if, the, if both these samples were from a primary tumor, um, this would be indicative of, of kind of mixture of heterogeneity throughout the tumor. So you've sampled maybe from the, from the left-hand side of the tumor and the right-hand side of the tumor, and they both see this, the, the, the same subclones. So you've got, it looks like, it would look like you've got kind of intermixed subclones kind of throughout the tumor. Um, uh, in this case, say, actually these are um, uh, a primary and metastatic sample, or in fact, I, th I think I've switched now, and these are actually both uh, metastatic samples. And so what this is actually indicating is that in this, um, in this tumor, um, we actually have polyclonal seeding. So we've got two different metastases, and both of them have some cells that, that have this, cluster, this set of mutations and some cells that don't. So we must have had at least two cells that have moved from, from one metastasis to the other metastasis. Um, um, just just want to say this is, th these results are, are taken from uh, a larger uh, sample set. So we actually had 10, uh, uh, 10 men. We, did, we carried out autopsy study, multi-sampling of metastases from these 10 men. Um, and um, to, to go back to this, uh, this figure, we actually had from this, from this man, we actually had uh, 10 samples, not just the two that I showed you earlier. Um, so these are, the, these are the two clusters that are seen subclonally um, in these two samples. When we look across all the other samples, in fact, this purple cluster was seen subclonally uh, in, in many of the samples. Um, you notice that it's not seen in the initial uh, primary prostate. It's also not seen in the seminal vesicle, which is very, very close to the prostate. So it appears that, that this um, set of mutations appeared um, uh, later on in, in, in evolution, uh, but then spread around um, the different metastatic sites, spread around the body. And um, we actually identified uh, many other, other clusters of mutations that have um, very different uh, sp uh, uh, patterns of, of, of spread around the different metastatic sites. Oops. Um, I, I just, before I go on to um, talk about the um, tree construction that we do with this, I just want to mention these, these two rules. So these were, these were first described in a paper from uh, Quay's group. Um, uh, but we, we've kind of been using them kind of uh, implicitly in, 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 in tree construction. Um, so the, the first is the, 
here's the sum rule. So we can have uh, clusters of mutations. Uh, this is just an example. So you may have clonal mutations in 100% of cells, and then subclones at 80% and 60%. Um, in this case, we know that the phylogeny uh, must actually be linear um, because, uh, basically because the 80% the and the 60% can't be branching because they would sum to more than 100%, which, which isn't possible. So the 60% must be within the 80%. One way of viewing, viewing this is this, this kind of nesting with these ovals. Uh, the other way is to, is to, to see it as a, as a phylogenetic tree. Um, the other rule that we use is this crossing rule. So if we have, uh, so, so this is where if we have multiple samples uh, and we have different subclones, uh, one of which um, is, is, is higher um, in one sample than the other. So we have this red subclone here, which is higher in sample one. And then if we have another subclone, which is higher in a different sample, so the blue subclone is higher in sample two, then they, these must be branching, because one of them is higher in one sample, the other is higher in the other sample. So we can view this in these, these nested plots as being that the blue is now separate from the red rather than nested within it. And in terms of the phylogeny, uh, we would see these as branching. So these, basically, we, we use these rules to, to reconstruct the phylogenetic tree. Um, and so from, from analysis of the sample that I, that I just showed you, uh, this is the phylogeny that we get. Um, um, I just want to kind of draw your attention to, it, to a couple of things. Um, firstly, if you look on the, on the leaves of this branch, they have multiple letters. So D, G, J each correspond to different metastatic samples, and H and K each correspond to different metastatic samples. So these are subclones that have spread from one metastatic site to another. We've got polyclonal seeding. Um, and I think this, this um, emphasizes the, the, the point that was made yesterday, um, that, um, that, that sample trees, constructing trees that relate samples doesn't, doesn't really make any, any sense. And sample trees are not phylogenies. So this is a phylogeny which represents the, the, the clones and the subclones and the relationship between them. Uh, but that is quite different to the, um, what, to, to the relationship between individual samples because the samples are a mixture of different subclones and may have different, different bits from different bits of the tree. Um, um, and it kind of, kind of relates to, to, to what Ben was saying uh, yesterday, that the, that the phylogeny and the migration pattern are you know, two, two separate things, and we need to be very, very careful not to, not to confuse them. Um, so so in, in, in this tumor, what we saw is that was, there was a, a, a kind of mixture of linear um, evolution and more parallel evolution, which led to polyclonal seeding. So if we just go back to the that last figure. Um, the, the C is C here, C sample, uh, here is the primary tumor, but then we see this kind of progression going down this kind of line um, as the, the, um, as the uh, cancer uh, uh, transmits from one metastasis to another. So it's kind of linear progression down that line, um, but we also see this, this, this parallel progression with the polyclonal seeding. So we start from the, from the primary sample, um, moves to, to, to nearby uh, sites. Uh, we then see spread from the seminal vesicle, which is next to the prostate, to multiple sites. And then we see this uh, polyclonal seeding um, between uh, multiple different sites. Um, and I think, I think uh, so, so we, we, we did all this uh, manually, um, but I think uh, ben, ben has, has kind of confirmed that, that we see uh, <coughs> that the automated method um, reproduces this polyclonal seeding pattern. Um, and say so what, what we're, we're commonly seeing is this kind of linear progression. Um, I think you, the, the, there is some, some argument about whether this is, is um, metastasis to metastasis seeding, because it is, it is, at least theoretically, it's possible that you're actually having ongoing evolution within the primary tumor that is just kind of spitting out um, uh, metastases at, at, at different points rather than actually going from one metastasis to another. Um, but what I, what I want to emphasize is that we do, we see in, in a lot of the tumors, we see this kind of generally linear pattern that there seems to be, um, that there seems to be, it, it's very, very one-sided going down, down this branch, um, where, whereas we, we don't see um, uh, kind of so much evolution within the primary tumor. Um, I think I've only, I've only got a couple of minutes, but I, I just want to uh, briefly say something about this, this other study. So this is a, um, a similar study in, in esophageal cancer. It's had very similar study design. Um, we carried out multiple sampling of multiple metastases from patients um, who, who had died of um, esophageal cancer. 
And uh, this is just showing the, 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 the phylogenetic trees that we, uh, the, the, that we produce using, using the same methods as we use for the prostate paper. Um, what was really um, unexpected and interesting about this was the, was the shape of the trees. Um, so, so marked on here, I don't know if you can, you can see very well, but we've, on, on uh, most of these trees, we have a red circle, um, uh, which is, um, marks the, the, star, the um, a kind of a, a star shape uh, on the phylogeny, um, which is very different to what we saw in the prostate cancers. So in the prostate cancer, we generally saw this linear progression down, down one lineage. In the esophageal cancers, we don't see that at all. We seem to see this uh, explosion from, from one point uh, leading to this kind of uh, stellate uh, pattern. Um, and we, we, we term this um, diaspora, um, that we, we seem to have these multiple subclones that have spread from the primary to multiple metastatic sites um, at one time point. Um, so whereas the, whereas the prostate cancers seem to progress quite slowly, and you can, you can clearly see uh, the progression with multiple mutations being acquired in between each step um, in esophageal cancer, you don't see that at all. You see this, this explosion. It appears that there's been um, uh, a, a op opening of some um, uh, niche, maybe, that, that, that has uh, enabled uh, multiple subclones um, to, to, to appear and to spread to multiple sites. Uh, this is just a zoomed in uh, figure of one of, these, one of these cancers. You can clearly see the, uh, the, the, this point here, which is spread to different sites. Uh, the L are um, lymph nodes, uh, e, e is uh, esophagus, and D is distant, uh, distant metastasis. So you can see um, contemporaneous spread to lymph nodes and uh, distant organs. Um, and this is ju ju just the, the, the colors here show you that um, the, the different subclones are not uh, constrained to different regions of the body. Um, so we can see within the liver, um, we have multiple subclones that have spread to the liver, uh, and similarly in diff different parts of the body, we have, we have a mixture of different subclones. So um, it, it, it appears that there isn't um, um, the, the, there isn't any or, or very little selection for, um, for destination site for these subclones. Um, uh, this is just, uh, I think signature, signature analysis has been mentioned a couple of times before. Um, there is the signature one, um, which, which we think is, is clock-like, is, is occurring at a, at a pretty constant rate. Uh, and uh, on here it's shown as uh, the, purple, the purple bars. Um, what you notice is that the purple bars are seen in the, 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 the clones to the left, which are those that are towards the top of the tree, and then we just, it just disappears. We don't see signature one in the later subclones. Um, and we think that's because very little time actually elapsed um, in, the, in, in the spread of the metastasis. So this, there, there was no time for, for um, acquisition of signature one mutations. And there was this very rapid spread, um, which pro probably explains why um, esophageal cancer is so much more um, dangerous than, than prostate cancer. Uh, I'm going to skip over these. Um, just, just, just bri quickly show, show this my, my, my last slide. Um, so, so the this kind of explosion with this stellate pattern is kind of suggestive of perhaps uh, neutral evolution. Look, looks a bit like the kind of uh, Big Bang uh, uh, model that's been uh, presented uh, previously, but. We, if you actually look for, for, for drivers in these subclones, you can identify multiple drivers. Um, so, so this is just looking at um, amplification. So a lot of the drivers in esophageal cancer are um, copy number changes, particularly amplifications rather than um, SNVs. Um, and um, uh, basically for, for each tumor here, I've split the, split the figure into three, three sections for the primary tumor, lymph nodes, and distant metastases. Um, and for all of the driver genes, um, we see that there are subsets of these um, tumors. So, so we will have a, an amplification which is only seen in lymph node metastases or is only seen in, in distant organs. So it's apparent that there is ongoing evolution uh, that these tumors are acquiring uh, driver events all the time as they spread around the body. It's, it's not neutral, uh, but what we, what we think is that it's more um, looks more like there's been, there, there's been uh, so, so, so some, some event that has opened up um, these, uh, these sites um, for, for th th that's enabled the, the tumor to spread to metastatic sites, but there is still ongoing evolution. I'm going to skip over that. Um, th these are the papers that I've, I've uh, talked about today. Um, 
as you can see, there, there are many, many authors on these papers, um, but I just want to uh, just mention the, 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 the people on the, on the top right who are the, really the, the, the drivers of these papers. Uh, so Peter Van Loo and Peter Campbell for the, uh, the, the life history of 21 breast, breast cancers. Uh, Ganesh Gundem was the, was the lead author on the, uh, the prostate metastatic paper. Um, uh, Ganesh and Tom both worked on the, the other uh, prostate paper, which, I, which is on the bottom right. Um, uh, as did Dan Brewer and Aisha Narani and Rebecca Fitzgerald um, uh, led the work on esophageal cancer. Um, thank you. Sorry I've uh, overrun a bit. <laughs> Does anybody have? Yeah, okay, quid. <laughs> Thanks for responding so nicely to my shouting. Um, but <laughs> have, have you thought in Battenberg of like grouping together your subclonal changes to identify like say subclonal lineages that, that might share uh, common copy number changes? So, 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 so to actually include copy number changes on the, on, on the tree? Yeah, um, or yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Or even just yeah. group together the ones because you, you do it separately in every segment. Right, yeah. So, so I mean, you know, you know we, was, as, as you know, we, we looked at this within, within PCOG, that there are different methods for subclonal calling of copy number. So, you, so, so the, the, I think the two approaches basically are to, to do this segmentation and then call every segment separately, which is what we do in Battenberg, um, which means then that every segment will have a different CCF estimate. Um, and the other that's used by uh, things like um, um, H, uh, uh, Clone HD um, will look for subclones across the whole genome. So it will say there are, um, uh, I, I know you, you know this quite, I'm kind of explaining to the students, uh, uh, that um, which will look across the whole genome and will say we think there are these two different copy number states, one which is in 70% of cells and one which is in 30% of cells. So, um, that second method obviously has, has, has some advantages because you can then say we actually have this, this clone, this subclone, which has this copy number pattern and this one which has this other copy number pattern. Um, but um, the, the disadvantage is that I think you, you reduce the sensitivity uh, by doing that. That, that. I think Battenberg has much greater sensitivity for identifying copy number events than those methods that, that try and call across the whole genome. Um, so we, we have... Um, so, so, so we, we, we have used various approaches to try and um, actually group them and assign them to, to, um, to subclones. Um, the first approach was using, actually using our um, uh, Dirichlet process, but, but applying it to copy number, and then, which I think, I think you've done a similar, similar thing. And, and the, base, the, the way that we do that is by making, basically mocking up a, a pseudo SNV. So, so we, we, appear, we, we present it to the algorithm um, as if it's an SNV, um, and then we, we basically have to give it some appropriate depth and allele frequency. So I think, I think the way that we do that now is we basically look at the, the mutation rate um, for, for SNVs within the segment, and then we will mock up mutations um, that, that represent, actually represent the copy number events, but we'll put in the same number of mutations that you would expect to have if they were SNVs. So then we're kind of weighting the, the copy number equally with the, uh, with the SNVs. Um, that kind of works, it works quite well, um, but the, I think, what, I think a, a difficulty is that, um, is, is that, the, the, the copy number events are not, they're not all correct. We, we know that we're missing some breakpoints. And so we will have some segments which we, we might call as subclonal, but in fact they're a mixture of two different clonal states, and we've just missed the breakpoint. Um, um, and so, and by, by, you know, if, if that's a large segment, then actually you would be um, weighting that quite heavily. If you put in, if you've got the yeah, whole, whole of chromosome one and you've actually, you've actually miscalled it, um, but you, you, you put in pseudo SNVs that represent the whole of that chromosome. It, it then you know drags the um, drags the solution towards actually an incorrect solution. So so we're still kind of working on it um, because we're kind of wary of that. Um, I mean I think I think the one solution might be to to try and cluster those copy number events that that, that can be nicely clustered with the, the SNVs, but to allow the possibility to actually exclude some of them. 
um, to say we, we actually don't, don't believe this and it should go into a, a kind of garbage cluster. I mean, I think the same applies to SNVs, that we nearly always have you know, an artifact cluster. Uh, and I think with the, when we're clustering the mutations, we, it, it would probably be advantageous to actually say, well, we're going to exclude these ones because we, we just don't believe them. So thank you very much. Uh, let's thank uh, David again for a fascinating talk.